So welcome everybody uh, with this uh, amazing uh, uh, panel. Um, we have uh, Wai Vom. She is a uh, former international labor rights uh, lawyer and also founder of uh, Project Include, co-founder. And uh, she's a very active on the diversity front and looks at everything from an international labor rights lens. I think that's really important. We have uh, Tracy, she's an engineer most recently at Pinterest, also co-founder of Project uh, Include. And uh, very important that today they speak uh, not on behalf of Project Include. Of course, the work they do there is very important in forming their opinion, but they speak on their own uh, behalf uh, here today. Two very impressive uh, uh, women. Uh, and we have a director of the Next Web uh, Conference, Beat Sedan. He's responsible for us all being here uh, today. So uh, a big applause uh, for the panelists. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, to start off, I want to give the uh, word to Bietze, who, because there was a certain event uh, leading up to this uh, panel. So maybe you can uh, explain a little bit. Yep, definitely. Uh, thank you, uh, Janneke. So I think maybe some of the people here uh, will have followed uh, an online discussion that happened two months ago where um, we invited a woman to come and speak at the event called uh, Lovey, and uh, she declined because we weren't able to give her a speaking fee. And um, then somebody else uh, wrote an article about that, uh, insinuating that maybe gender discrimination had played uh, a part in that decision. Um, personally, for me and my team, that was, uh, yeah, it hurt a lot to, uh, to read something uh, like that about uh, how we would approach uh, our speaker policy. And yeah, when you're hurt, one of the things you often do is you decide to defend yourself and defend your actions. And if I look back at that now, I um, would have rather focused on giving the broader discussion of uh, gender diversity and inclusion a platform, because I do think it is a very valuable topic to talk about. And that's one of the reasons also why I'm very happy that uh, Janneke, Yvonne, and Tracy are here today um, to talk about what both as an event, but also as tech companies, we could do to be more inclusive and uh, to tackle uh, the problems that are out there. So um, hence why I'm very glad that this panel is here and uh, why I've also decided to, to join the panel myself. Very brave. <laughs> it is a powerful panel. Um, so first, uh, I think it's a good idea to talk about a few common uh, pitfalls. I think uh, very often people maybe have the right intentions when they uh, have a certain things they try to in increase diversity or inclusion, but then the effect is not really contributing um, uh, to it. So maybe. Uh, why if I, I, I can give the word to you, what do you <laughs> see as a few really common uh, pitfalls? I think so. Um, I, I've had several conversations about this, and I think this is really interesting in the European context because uh, there's a different history here. But um, I think it's still applicable. Um, and I think the, the pitfall that I like to highlight is a focus on gender exclusively. So even as we're sort of framing this discussion, I think it's really important to note that the tension with what happened with Lovey wasn't just about gender, but also about race, right? Because she's an African-American woman, she sort of viewed that through that lens. Um, and I think a lot of other people, particularly US audiences, were aware of that as well. And uh, quite often when I work with clients, I hear, you know, um, we want to just focus on gender for now, or we want to work with this specific group for now. And what happens, um, and what I tell them is, sometimes when you just focus on gender, you end up uh, expanding the circle of exclusion and not creating um, an inclusive environment that's able to sort of capture um, everyone. So if I were to say one of the biggest pitfalls, I would, I would name that, um, net, that first, yeah. Tracy, maybe you can elaborate a bit on that. What, what do you see mostly? Yeah, one of the comments I hear very frequently in talking about diversity and inclusion is that it's uh, about lowering the bar, or there's a pipeline problem, that there's not enough qualified candidates that aren't white men, and so if we want to be more diverse and inclusive, what we're doing is finding people who are not as good, um, and this is a little bit upsetting to me because I think what often is going on is that we're defining what we're looking for in the, um, in the wrong ways, um, whether that's for conference speaker lineups or for candidates uh, for hiring. 
um, for example, in like a lot of engineering hiring, so I'm an engineer, I've been a part of a lot of engineering conversations, oftentimes the focus will end up being on hiring students out of the top tier universities who study computer science, when really what we're looking for in engineering is build if people who can build products. Um, and so defining the criteria incorrectly will artificially construct uh, the pool of people that you're looking at. Um, if we're looking at speakers, for example, like we don't necessarily just need the people who have already spoken before, but there's often a bias towards getting people who've already been headliners or already have high profiles, when you could get really interesting insights um, and learnings from people who don't necessarily have that profile already. And uh, I think being very deliberate about defining what you're actually looking for, whether it's for a speaker lineup or for hiring, um, and then just being more creative and looking for the types of people that can fill those roles can help. Um, and it's often not just like there's a pipeline problem. Sometimes there, there's a pipeline problem if you're just looking for uh, people who've run companies of a certain size or if you're looking for people who've had very particular sets of experience. There may be some pipeline issues, but oftentimes it's not that. And uh, to equate diversity and inclusion with lowering the, the bar uh, does disservice to the whole effort. Well, and I think uh, talking about uh, first-time speakers, uh, when I was involved in another uh, uh, conference uh, as, an, as an advisor, we decided to give a speaker coach to all the first-time uh, speakers. And that can help them actually, uh, because they had super interesting uh, stories, and giving them a speaker coach session can help them give the uh, confidence to really go, uh, go on stage. So um, I'm, I'm reading uh, a lot uh, about this topic, and I see some differences uh, in the discussions that are going on in the US versus uh, Europe, where we are a bit behind in recognizing uh, the issue. And, uh, but, but I think in general, it's a priority for most companies and um, most leadership uh, teams, at least in the way they communicate um, uh, about it. But if you look at the actual results, there's hardly any improvement. So are we here facing um, something that is in fashion to talk about, but nothing really happens? <laughs> what is the reasons that the numbers are still extremely bad? So one thing is um, people will often say that diversity and inclusion is a priority, but a priority means that it is something that gets prioritized over something else. So there have to be trade-offs made. And so if diversity and inclusion is labeled as a priority, but you never make trade-offs in favor of it, mm -hmm. it's not actually a priority. So if you say 20 things are important, none of them, like, there's a lot of them that are actually not important. Like there are a few that you will actually end up prioritizing. Um, and so a lot of companies now, I, I think, do find it in vogue to say that they care about diversity and inclusion, but are not quite ready to make the hard trade-offs and put in the time and energy and resources to make change happen. Yeah, and I, I just to follow up on Tracy's point, I, I think that the resources is so important because, like, it's hard. You know, I think uh, people feel like maybe it's something that's intrinsic or like I should just know how to be inclusive. And, and it's quite the opposite. I think the workforce and our societies are sort of built on these paradigms of exclusion. And dismantling them and undoing them and bringing people in is actually counterintuitive. And so figuring out how to go about and doing that, do that, and leveraging the right expertise um, is quite difficult. And I often see companies who are a year in and like you said, they've made no progress. And it's kind of like, well, what have you done? And they're like, we, we had a brown bag lunch. And it's like, that's <laughs> not, that's, <laughs> that's not going to get the results you want. It's great. But um, I think that having a more complex strategy, treating it like a business problem as opposed to a side project, um, these are all things that I think contribute to the likelihood of success. And, and Vita, um, in your role as conference organizer, what, what do you see you can contribute to uh, yeah, in, in increasing this, making this better, more inclusive? Yeah, so I think an, an interesting point to touch on the, uh, what you call the pipeline problem is obviously when we uh, put our form online for people to apply to speak at the conference, uh, what will happen is we'll get anywhere between 1,000 and 1,500 uh, requests for people to speak. 95% of them are white male. Mm -hmm. um, and I also see that as an event organizer, we, it will be too easy to say, okay, you know, this is the pipeline we have. So if the lineup is 90 or 95% white male, then that's just a reflection of, uh, of the industry. 
And I think as an event organizer, we do have an opportunity uh, or a way to leverage the fact that we're in a position to put in a little bit more effort to find the great stories from women or from minorities and put them on stage. And especially if I look at everybody that's talking at the event uh, these two days, everybody's here because they have a great story, because they're an expert in their area. Um, it just takes a little bit more effort to, uh, to go out and find it. But there, there are great resources. A lot of people have invested time in putting together lists of people that do great jobs at speaking uh, professionally. So, um, so I think that's one thing that we try to put a lot of effort in. And uh, we're still not there. We, uh, if you look at the gender balance now, we're at 33% uh, female and the rest male. Um, but it's something we're wor working towards. And um, one of the things, one of the starts that we'll be doing is at least publishing our results of um, how diverse the lineup was this year as a benchmark for ourselves, but also all of our attendees to see next year whether we were able to improve. So Wyvon, maybe, maybe you can uh, comment on that, publishing uh, numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's different uh, discussions about it. Some yeah. say it's a good thing, others say it's a bad thing. Should people publish their numbers or? I think absolutely. I think um, especially in tech, we see that we have to create accountability around the issue. And publishing numbers uh, is a way to do that. It's also a way to sort of track um, the success or, or um, challenges that you're facing in the diversity and inclusion project. However, I don't think numbers is enough. Like what we saw in 2014 when companies first started releasing their numbers, um, thanks to folks like Tracy, um, was that like the numbers were bad and we were hoping that that itself would move the needle. And what we saw in 2016 and even in 2017 is not a lot of change, right? And so I think those numbers, uh, that transparency has to be augmented with things like a strategic roadmap for increasing inclusion, and we, we, you know, we talked about this, one that accounts for all of the parts of business that diversity and inclusion touch, right? Not just hiring, but thinking about how we grow our employees, thinking about our performance management techniques, our performance review techniques, um, thinking about our external as well as internal communications. Um, all of those contribute to this relative success or failure of diversity and inclusion. So numbers is a great first step. Um, and I always say, uh, but it has to be followed up with um, a little bit more of augmented resources. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the things you said, I, I think, which is really important, is that everybody on stage is here because of their expertise. Um, uh, but, but you have probably also heard the comment very often, well, then, do you want to be chosen just because you are a, a woman? How would you respond to that? It's a very good question. And <laughs> one comment I want to make like, as, as an aside is a lot of this discussion is very uncomfortable. And so even in the process of tracking metrics, uh, for example, you have to start labeling candidates. And I've been through this process um, as a conference organizer and also as someone who's worked on hiring. We're trying to look at our pipelines. We want to make sure that we have diversity. To end up with these stats that we want to publish, we also have to track our candidates through the, the funnel. And it's uncomfortable to start labeling people as like male, female, are they adding to diversity in like some other dimension or not. Um, it's harder on the racial ethnic front where sometimes it's unclear how people would self-identify. So you're looking at people and trying to guess if they would identify as black or Latinx. So all these things are uh, very uncomfortable. So I just want to put that out there first. Um, I think on this tension of feeling like I, I'm invited just because I'm a woman or representing some marginalized, marginalized class, um, like I've, I've felt it before and um, it's definitely been exacerbated by people reaching out and saying, we want more women, so will you please speak? Uh, I think that's not the right approach. Um, I think for, for me personally, I've had to grapple with that um, and just be more self-confident and feel like I have something to add. And the fact that I don't look like the other speakers is a good thing. Um, and that is the unique value add I'm bringing. Um, one example of this, I was on stage once with um, TechCrunch Disrupt, and I was on a judging panel where there were three or four other people on my panel who were all white men over the age of 40, who were all investors, professional investors. Um, and I felt like I checked every single diversity box. Like they just <laughs> needed somebody on stage to be not white, not male, young, and technical. <laughs> 
And I felt really out of place with like everybody else here is like more qualified than I am to be judging these startups, like they do this professionally. And then I took a step back and realized that the fact that I came from such a different background was a huge value add to the panel. And so when we were judging these startups that were coming back, I had a perspective um, as a woman, as somebody who's like more interested in things like shopping. So there was like one shopping and commerce startup that came along. There was actually um, I think a more technical startup that came along that was building APIs. And because I'm an engineer, like, I could see like, what they were actually doing with the code that they put on screen. Um, and so even though I felt like I was out of place, and in fact, somebody uh, went on Quora afterwards and asked why I had been invited to go be on, on stage, because they felt like I was less qualified. <laughs> um, so I, there's a lot of this doubt that would be circulating from externally as well. I felt like I actually did add a lot of value because I had this different background. Um, and really what they wanted on stage was people who could ask interesting questions of the startups that were presenting. And I was able to do that because of what I represented and the sort of experiences I had, which were different than what the other speakers and, and judges had. Yeah, and I, I also, to add to that point, I don't think that, I think that point assumes that like, we're operating in a, value, in a vacuum where everybody else is like, they're on the basis of merit. And I don't know if you all saw this sort of um, thing that was released yesterday with like the, the VC comments from the Swedish VCs about <laughs> women versus men. But what I find in my work is I do recruiting as part of my, my firm ReadySet. And there's, um, some people get the benefit of the doubt. And the benefit of the doubt often goes to people who they think have potential or who they think look like leaders. And those are generally people who look like the people in power, right? And so, I mean, maybe there's tokenism if, you know, I'm getting into a, an event as a black woman, but then there's also tokenism in the fact that somebody just looks like the idea of success, you know? It, regardless of merit, we're probably on equal terrain, like, somebody looks like the idea of success, or they look like somebody that can be invested in. Um, and quite often, people from marginalized groups don't get that benefit of the doubt. Yeah, I've seen some parallels in like this sort of conservatism and wanting to go with the status quo on the technical side. So I did a little bit of work consulting with the U.S. federal government a couple of years ago. And in these agencies where they're trying to pick database systems, they'd always go with Oracle, even though it's very clunky and expensive. It's like Because nobody got, gets fired for choosing what has already been used. Mm -hmm. um, so even though Oracle database systems, no offense to anybody from Oracle, are not necessarily the best choice for a lot of these organizations. Like Nobody gets fired for doing that. And similarly, people don't get fired for promoting the white man on his potential, whereas in some situations where managers are deciding who they want to take a bet on, it's a lot easier to promote the white man who looks like the previous uh, leaders in those roles. <coughs> and uh, that person feels like, oh, like it was the wrong choice, but not because I was trying to promote somebody from an underrepresented mm -hmm. background where, say, we had put in like a, a black woman, so not exactly the idea of success because it doesn't pattern match against who was previously in that role, then the manager who had made that decision might get called out for trying to promote diversity. And so there is this um, onus that is borne by people from underrepresented backgrounds of having to represent their entire group. And I've often felt this as a woman, like if I fail, I look bad on all women. Mm -hmm. um, but people who are making these hiring and leadership decisions also feel a little bit of that. It's like if I put someone from an underrepresented group there and they fail, then is it because I was trying too hard to promote diversity? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, it's like in the kind of like databases example, like it would have been better to use Postgres or MySQL and not go with Oracle. But that's like the risky move and it's easier to go with what is already the status quo. And I think um, maybe for the audience, it would be good to understand um, maybe your advice, what they should do to actually make a change that has uh, impact. What, what, what should everybody do so that in five years time, the numbers are actually better? So I hesitate a little bit to give any specific pieces of advice because it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. It's not you can just do one thing. Everybody wants to hear, like, for orchestras, if we just put up a screen and do blind auditions, like, we'll fix the whole problem. Like, and, and that it feels nice to have that kind of solution. It's just not that easy. Um, so what I would encourage people to think about is actually more like the fundamentals of implementing diversity and inclusion strategy. Um, what we've laid out as values for Project Include, for example, are uh, inclusion, intersectionality, and understanding that diver diversity and inclusion is more than just gender. Uh, it's also race, it's also class, it's also just this like whole experience of background and being very aware of the intersections of those identity classes. Um, 
comprehensiveness, so actually having a big strategy instead of just one-off tactics, and accountability through metrics. So having these sorts of like fundamental values, I think, is the best way to approach diversity and inclusion. Uh, I, I can also, I think we can also brainstorm specific things for people to do, but I hesitate to lay those out first because people might take those specific tactics and feel like once they check those off that they're done. Yeah, I think I, I want to just sort of really lift up your point, Tracy, about that it really, um, it has to be a comprehensive approach. I think it also has to be approached back by research and, and data. So, I mean, there are certain things that we found in the social science research that are associated with its successes, diversity, inclusion, and things that are associated with stagnation or failure. Unconscious bias training, for example, um, while it can be useful, if implemented alone, is associated with stagnation or failure um, in terms of diversity and increasing numbers of women, uh, particularly um, uh, women uh, of color. Um, so, but, but there are things that are, that are associated with success, like developing a diversity strategy we've already talked about. Having inclusive policies is one way to create accountability around that, right? So having a code of conduct, having an anti-harassment policy, being very clear about what's going to happen if people violate those policies, and, and developing a culture of accountability around that. Those are two things. Having mentorship programs and sponsorship programs are also associated with success. But in order to have all of these things, like, <laughs> you have to have somebody who knows what they're doing to develop this programming for your organization. Um, and you have to go about it, like to Tracy's point, in a comprehensive manner. So um, uh, I, I want to end uh, <clears throat> the panel later with, uh, with, with a question to you, Vitsa. What are you going to do next year to make, uh, to, to make the next web uh, more diverse and inclusive? But be, before we get there, maybe also, um, from each of you an advice what people should not do? What's an absolute don't? <sighs> I feel like we gave a couple of don'ts, so I'm just like gonna put them all together. Don't just focus on women. Um, don't just focus on training. Um, don't try to shift the burden to people of marginalized groups to do this work for you, particularly if they're not being compensated for it. Um, those are my, my big three don'ts. I don't want to have a whole list of don'ts. <laughs> I guess I would say just don't assume that it will be easy and it will be uncomfortable and it's going to require a lot of hard work. Um, and I would reiterate the, the last point that Wybaum was making. Don't assume that it's going to be free. Uh, this is something that if you value, you'll have to put money and resources behind. Yeah, so I think I've also spoken to you a lot now about this topic as well, and there are two key takeaways for me, um, and one of them hasn't really brought, been brought up here yet, which, uh, which you gave me, and that's also that because the topic is so complicated, that it is also a good idea to just pay an expert to you know, help you figure out how, as a company, you could approach this. Um, I think especially in what I've read about this, learned about this in the past weeks, uh, definitely get the sensation there's so much, um, you know, that, that you need to read up on and understand before you know how to tackle it in a way that it, that it does make sense. Um, so that's one thing that, uh, that we will be doing. And then the second thing is obviously one I mentioned earlier that um, I understand now that it's a starting point to um, kind of share our uh, results on how diverse the lineup has been uh, this year and to put that out there so that people uh, can see next year how far we've gotten. Um, but also that that is only a starting point. And then if, you, if we want to do better, we have to follow up with more of a strategy throughout the company and throughout uh, the year round. So that's something that, you know, after this event, we will, we will start working on. Okay, sounds, sounds really great. Thank you for being on the panel. Uh, you're both here uh, for the rest of the day, I think, mm -hmm. so uh, reach out to them if you have uh, more, uh, more questions. But for now, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you.